Well, welcome back to Roy on Rescue, Rescue fans. So some of you may have been asking yourselves, uh, how is this Ebola thing going to affect me? I'm not in the healthcare system. I'm not, you know, a traveler. And so, you know, I'm hearing an awful lot about this stuff in the news, but is it really going to affect me? And if it is, what do I do to protect myself? Well, if you've got this kind of question, stay tuned for more information on how to protect yourself and your family from Ebola. So there's a few things to remember when it comes to any type of infectious disease. They're really limited to three main things. One, you've got to have a pathogenic microorganism in the environment that could make you sick. Number two, you've got to have a route of infection, some way to get it from its source to the susceptible host, and that's the third susceptibility. We have to be able to get infected by the virus, but more than infected by it or exposed to it, we need to actually be able to get sick from it. So, if one takes any of those three ingredients out of the mix, it is impossible to get sick. Now, obviously, thousands of people have come down with Ebola since the first news hit media in regards to the infection of Ebola in Africa and in now in the U.S., which has been pretty limited. And so I think it's important for me to not really talk about all the other stuff that has already been discussed in mass media, but trying to stay true to form to how I can be of assistance to you is more how does this apply to me? And, and if it applies to me, what can I do to protect myself and my family? And I think it's really important to understand that, number one, the virus isn't going away. It's been around forever. I think it lives in organic material. Um, it's normally then um, picked up by certain animals. If those animals are eaten, um, then people can get sick from it. And that's kind of the history source of Ebola. Number two... Uh, you know, we can do a lot to protect ourselves from any infectious disease, but specifically Ebola, even if they determine that it truly is an airborne virus, um, there's things we can do to protect ourselves. And we're going to focus on that here in just a minute. But then thirdly, we don't have a, a vaccine yet that has been approved or shown its efficacy to be extremely high. And so there's no way of making ourselves immune to uh, to the virus without actually getting sick from the, the Ebola virus and surviving. Um, number one part is the Ebola virus is actually, it's obviously something that people get sick from pretty easily. And so there's not a lot we can do about that except for try to kill it, which we do with bleach solution. But let's focus on the, the area that we actually can prevent and, and, and control, which is the route of infection. Ebola can only be transmitted from a sick individual, not a non-symptomatic individual. So if they seem to be healthy and normal, your chances of actually contracting, even if they're carrying the Ebola virus, is extremely small. It's when they're actually uh, febrile and they've actually got some of the symptoms that they're truly infectious now. And some of the symptoms of the infection are much like the flu, diarrhea, vomiting, and and there's even um, a pretty good amount of Ebola virus in things like saliva, tears, and other body fluids as well. So um, that's why when it first came out that you could not catch Ebola through the air, you know, I, I kind of questioned that because all you have to do is sneeze or cough or, you know, spray the saliva from a sick person and suddenly you've got, you know, something that's at least nebulized through the air. It may not actually be drying out and sticking to dust particles and floating around for hours and hours, but it, the droplets could still potentially be infectious. And so that's important to, to keep in mind. But from a practical standpoint, I'll relate my scenario and maybe this will be a good example for you and just ways that you can be a little more conscientious and be careful, especially when traveling to help prevent an infection. Um, I walked into a restroom where um, clearly somebody had been ill. Now, I recognized right away that this was probably a contaminated area. And so with my elbow, I turned the knob, grabbed a couple napkins, turned the knob, opened it, and got out of the bathroom right away. It might not have been anything, 
you know, other than just a, a general illness, or maybe they drank too much the night before, or maybe they just had the normal flu. But you can't be sure of that. And so I needed to make sure that I was doing everything I could in light of travelers. This is not this place that I was at was not far away from the airport. So I just wanted to spend a little extra attention and be really careful about um, maybe this was, you know, something that could be potentially infectious. And I wasn't going to, you know, wash my hands or use the toilet if it was contaminated uh, and, you know, run the risk of infecting myself. So I, I simply stopped. I didn't put anything down. I exited the bathroom. And then when I got in my car, I used alcohol gel, wiped, washed my hands really well. Then when I got to a place where I could use the restroom, I washed again. Now, that's probably enough um, to completely protect me from any kind of infection. I didn't get it on my body. I didn't get it in my body. And so I felt relatively safe. You know, if you're in that kind of situation and you see vomit or you see diarrhea or you see blood or other body fluids, you need to treat it as though it's potentially infectious and not touch it, not get it on our bodies. You know, if somebody sneezes on you, well, that's that's going to be a tough one and that's a little harder to deal with. But, um, you know, it's it's the secondary contact that we're really able to control well. And so, you know, if you see something that needs to be cleaned up and you don't know what it is, donning your personal protective equipment is a good idea, even from a lay person standpoint, to try to help put a barrier between you and the potentially infectious material. And this is true of any infectious material, you know, that's blood borne or body fluid borne, um, HIV, hepatitis B, uh, and other infectious materials or other infections. So other than that, you know, keep in mind that no one in the United States that actually was exposed to the Ebola virus has actually died from the symptoms of Ebola, which is a blessing. Um, could it be because our um, our healthcare system is a lot better? Maybe. Is it because our healthcare system is so much more accessible? Maybe. There's a lot of factors that play into this, but I just think understanding that that Ebola is in blood and body fluids isolation, making sure we don't touch any other thing that could be potentially infectious and then putting it in our on our body or in our body is going to be essentially important. And I would encourage you to even train your children to do the same. This has nothing to do with the heavy duty training that's required for healthcare professionals who will, will definitely be in contact with patients who are confirmed Ebola or suspected Ebola patients. That's a whole different training, but I did want to get this out to at least help people understand that if we break the chain of infection and, and put a barrier between the infectious or potentially infectious material in ourselves, there's absolutely no way we could get sick from that infection. So uh, if you see body fluids in an area, stay out of it, stay away from it. If you do get it on your body, wash it off with soap and water thoroughly. I would potentially throw away any type of clothing um, or you're gonna have to wash it and bleach and really be careful not to cross contaminate. Hope this helps. And from Royal Rescue, keep on rescuing. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.